A uh, word is gufa, but a little less than halfway down the page, and it's the last word on the line. Gufa, Amr Funa Amr Rav, Amr Rabbi, Kol Amr Amen Ask, Amr May Achshat Ami. Some, so we had a question yesterday. This this concept of Rabbi, somebody who a typical condition often uses the conditional almanas or you know sort of on condition. So uh, you know we you might think of it. Somebody says to his friend, "I'm giving this to you on condition that and you don't need to say on condition. You can make the condition without conditioning it, right? A condition <laughs> is obvious. It's, it's an if right. It's an if else type of situation. You know, if you cross the street, then then I'll give you the money." If you say to the guy, I'm giving you the money on condition you cross the street, what's mm -hmm. what's what's notable about the fact that you turned it into a condition? Mm -hmm. So Rebbe says, mm -hmm. It's as if you're saying, I'm giving you the money now when you cross the street. And the same oh. thing would, would be true with regard to condition. We'll get into you know the next the next mission, not this one, the one after that will be true. We'll get to today. It really goes heavily into this concept of, of what a condition is. What is what exactly is a tonight? <clears throat> But Rebbe says that Almanas is Almanas is It's as if you said, you know, the, the idea of a condition is that you're effectuating it immediately, conditional to the you know to to it being filled. Okay, Amar of Zera says, "Kia when we were in Bavel, Babylonia, have Amrin and Hod Amar of Hod Amar of Dummy. This concept that Rav Huna said in the name of Rebbe that saying specifically specifying a condition as a condition turns it into a me'achshav, meaning it, it effectuates it immediately, conditional to it happening later. Uh, right, and we said that there are major differences here. The the uh, critical component of uh, one second. <clears throat> Critical component. The, the critical uh, difference here was that according to Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda says that if a guy gives kedushin on a woman accepts kedushin on condition that her husband gives her two hundred dollars. So then, according to Rav Yehuda, the, kedu, the kedushin is not valid until he actually makes the payment. What she's saying to him is, when you give me two hundred dollars, that's when the kedushin will happen, unless the word amanas was used. You said almanas. If she says I'm accepting it, almanas, you give me two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Then what she's saying is no, no, no. I want the condition to happen right now, and there will be a conditional later on that you have to give me the two hundred dollars. Okay. A regular condition, according to Rav Yehuda, is is going to be a when. In other words, when this happens, then it should take effect. Mm -hmm. Whereas a condition with an almanas happens immediately. <laughs> Provided that the condition is fulfilled. When when is it fulfilled? Endless amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Now, Ruzera is saying is that the rabbis disagree. Please rub on a lot. The rabbis disagree. He... He saw Kil Hassan when he came to Israel. When he got to Israel, he found Ravasi quoting Rav Yechanan. Everyone agrees that saying Amanas is like saying Me'achshav. In other words, saying Amanas effectuates the condition, effectuates the action immediately, conditional to the condition being fulfilled, as opposed to a typical condition which does not have the word Amanas, which could be interpreted sometimes as a when. When the condition is fulfilled, that's when the action occurs. Okay, so, so according to Zera, everybody agrees. Making a, making a conditional statement, specifying it as a conditional, creates the, effectuates the transaction immediately. What's the debate? So the, the debate is only with regard to the question of which is what we saw yesterday. A person cannot give a divorce when he's dead. Let's say he says, I'm giving it to you now after I die. So what does that mean? Is he giving you the divorce now or is he giving it after I die? Now, if he says, I'm giving it to you now if I die, mm -hmm. so that, that's a retroactive divorce. 
right? When he dies, then the divorce is valid retroactively at the time because because he gave a divorce immediately. He said it's a divorce now if I die it within the next, you know, if the guy is taken into captivity in the case of a in the case of a war. One second. One second. Now, one, one, one more thing. Um, okay, so now the debate of Mehayim al is, so, so which is it? The, 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 the guy gives a divorce. I'm giving you the divorce now after I die. You're well, giving it now with a condition that you have to die, or you're giving it after you die, which case doesn't work. It's not a valid divorce. Mm -hmm. And that's the debate between the rabbis and Rebbe, between Rebbe and the rabbis. And the word you used again was the condition of how much time. So, according to this, so the two versions, the, the Gemara starts, the Gemara, we're just going back to yesterday, the Gemara had a question in, in Rebbe Yehuda. You know, I'm not going to go back to yesterday. Um, it'll, it'll be a little too much. Okay. Yeah. Basically, the Gemara was trying to, to to resolve yesterday's question. The Gemara had to resolve that there's a debate between the rabbis and Rebbe about Aymer uh, Amanask Aymer According to uh, according to according to Rebbe, saying Amanas makes makes the condition effective immediately. According to the rabbis, not. According to the second version of the Gemara. No, there's no debate. Everybody agrees to that concept. And I'm gonna translate as unconditional. Unconditional. Uh, the, the real the, the real component here is specifying a condition as a condition. You don't need to specify a condition as a condition. You can just do it without specifying it, right? I can say to you, uh, if you cross the street, then you'll get a million dollars, and if you don't cross the street, you won't get the money. I'm not. Or I could say to you, I'm giving you the money on condition you cross the street. Cross the street right? So specifying it as a conditional, according to Rebbe and the, according to the second version of the Gemara, both Rebbe and the rabbis agree specifying a conditional almanas automatically makes it me'achshav. It effectuates the transaction immediately. The debate is only with regard to uh, this, this weird situation when the guy says, I'm giving you to get today after I die. Vatanya, and the proof of this is... <clears throat> Rabbi says this would be would be a valid divorce. Okay, according to Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says that the, the debate between Rabbi and the rabbis is in Amanas. Right? Rabbi Yehuda clearly doesn't hold the second version of the Gemara, he holds the first version of the Gemara. That Rabbi holds that Amanas is coming out of and the rabbis disagree. Why are they debating? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, no, one second, one second. Why is the debate between the rabbis and Yehuda in the situation of Amana of Mehayim Alachamisa? Why can't they debate where he said Amanas? The Rebbe says Amanas works immediately, and the rabbis say Amanas, Amanas is no different than a when. So when you say, I'm giving you money on condition you cross the street, when you cross the street, then you get the money. As opposed to Rebbe's version of Amanas, which should be you get the money now, at some point you need to cross the street. So the Mara says, well, the the reason why they debate with regard to me, now after I die, it's to tell you that Rebbe holds that even in that situation, it's still a divorce. Even though there's some implication that the divorce is happening after he dies. So Mara says, 
So let's debate Almanas, where you'll see that the rabbis would, would hold that even in that, even if a guy gives a divorce on condition that I die, it's also an invalid divorce. Because the rabbis say on condition means when I die. As opposed to giving up the correct way to do it would be get, I'm giving you a divorce today if I die. So Gemara says, the, 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 the Gemara always tries in general, Talmud always tries to point out the power of the lenient opinion. Which is that Rebbe is so lenient that even in a situation where he says, I'm giving you a divorce today after I die, which is sort of a contradiction, mm-hmm. Rebbe still holds it's a valid divorce. Okay. It's the guy gives gives his wife a, a, a kedushin and says, I'm going to give you $200 from t- within the next 30 days. And he d- gives her the money. The kedushin is valid. If he doesn't give her the money, kedushin is not valid. She said, This is obvious. I would think maybe he's just trying to show her some honor. You know, and, and time isn't so important. He's just trying to give himself a reminder to remember that we has to make the payment within 30 days. But the 30 days shouldn't actually be a requirement. Kamashal, no, that's what he said. He means 30 days. Okay, so he makes a condition on condition that I have 15,000, 15 grand. So if he has the money, then fine. If he doesn't have the money, it's not a condition. Okay, the Nechoshem Yeshli. Why are we concerned? Maybe he does have the money. Because even though he he can't he can't show her fifteen thousand dollars, maybe he actually he does have fifteen thousand dollars to show her. The Oitanya. And and additionally we learned Khashinan Shamayeshli, meaning that it's a, it's actually a suffix condition. Because maybe he does have the money. Because there really is no way to know if a person doesn't have the money. It could be that he, you know, some lottery ticket from 10 years ago or some distant relative that that died. You know, left him as an inheritance. Sigmar says, you're right. Like, the truth of the matter is, if a guy makes a condition that really can't be verified, the condition is Kedusha Suffolk. It might be a valid condition. We just don't know. And therefore, the woman does require a divorce. But if you want to, if you want to be able to marry her, then the condition has to be certain. And the certainty can only be established by you pulling out 15 grand and putting it on the table and showing it to her. Um, um, uh, in this case, you don't have to actually see it, but but uh, that would be the next scenario. But the point is that, that he actually can verify it. The next scenario is I'm not sure Acham assigns us that I can show you the, the 15 grand. Tanala the scavna el alurus mishaloi. What she thinks is she's seeing his money. Mm-hmm. If he took the business account and shows her 15 grand in the business account, it doesn't work. She did that's obvious, it's not her money. But even though so the, the 15 grand is, is a business line of credit, but he gets to profit off the line of credit. So you think that maybe because he could profit off the 15 grand, it should be considered as if it's he, he showed her 15 grand that he could profit off of. So the says, No, no, that, that's not called. It's not, it's still not your money, and it has to be yours. Very similar set of of uh of, of um um general rules. Almanas Shiesh the Mishnah. Almanas Shiesh the base core. A condition that I have a property the size of 75,000 square hours. That's the, effectively the size of a base core. It's 50 by 15, I'm sorry, 50 by, by 1500. So he says, I have this big field and uh, he has the big field and the condition is valid. Almanas Shiesh the Makamplaini. If he says on condition that I have this property, you know, in New York or somewhere else, if he has the property, then the condition is valid. But if not, then the condition is not valid. On okay. Uh, finally, if he says I'm going to show you my property, seventy-five thousand uh, square miles. He has to show her the property. If he goes to a valley and he sees a big field that belongs to somebody else and he shows it to her, that, that doesn't work. Not, not a valid condition. Now, the Gemara here basically is a repeat of the Gemara we just saw. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe he actually does have a, 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 a big property. He just doesn't know about it. And moreover, we learn we are concerned maybe he does have such a property. So the Gemara says, like Kasha, Habi Kedushi Vade, Habi Kedushi Suffolk. With regard for the condition to be a certain condition, he has to actually prove to her that he has a field. But even if he can't prove it to her, we're still concerned maybe he actually does have the property, and therefore the condition is a suffix condition.
Lomeli lemis negabi arav, lomeli lemis negabi zuzi. Why is it necessary to repeat this scenario both with regard to land and with regard to money? It's much much easier to say that maybe the guy has seventy five grand because uh, whatever fifteen thousand dollars because maybe the fifteen thousand dollars is in a bank account somewhere it's in a safe deposit vault it's underneath his pillow his mattress whatever it is so it's very easy for people to hide money people do hide money it's much more logical to presume that somebody might actually have the money even though he doesn't admit to having it or he can't verify that he has it. With regard to property, uh, where's the title? You know, the global title search. It's unlikely that somebody actually has property and there isn't a record of it somewhere that people know about. So maybe we would say that it isn't even a suffix condition. It's not a condition at all. When we're not concerned, maybe he has property, but it's not, it's not, nobody knows about it. <laughs> that's what the, that's why the mission repeats itself. The Mara sort of repeat, repeats itself. Because even in that situation, it's still considered a suffolk condition. Okay. He says he has the land in New York. And he do, and if he has, it's condition. If not, it's not. Perhaps if he has the property in New York and, and he claims to have property in New York and really has in New Jersey. So he says to her, look, I'll hire a truck and I'll bring the, the produce from Jersey to New York. So it won't make a difference to you. You know, so the Gemara says, no, if, if you make a condition, you have to fulfill what the condition says. I'm not sure. He has to, he, 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 he's, he's marrying her on condition that he shows her a piece of property. He has to show his own property. If he shows her a property in the valley and says, uh, that's my property, it doesn't work. It has to actually be his. So the Mara says, Look, pshita, it's obvious. This tura is a fancy word for a resource. He's a sheer cropper on that piece of property. So he does have some you know, relationship with the property. Okay. Now for the next Gemara, it's a little, the, the, the setup is a little complicated. I'll just tell you the Gemara outside and then we'll see it. It'll go very quick. Okay. As follows, a guy has a property, and this property, let's say, has a unique feature. What's the feature? It has a, a steep hill in the middle of the property. Or alternatively, it has a huge rock. Another possibility is it has a big hole. Potentially, the, the hole is filled with water. Okay, now, he, we, we know that there's rules to property that's that's sold in a specific size. So, for example, in America, you know, a typical farm, I believe, is a quarter, right? You go from acre, a couple of acres, and then you go to a quarter, 160 acres. You know, when you homesteaded, you got a quarter. That was a typical number. And even today, when you sell ranches, they're often sold by the quarter, or they're or they're they're zoned by quarters. So, in in, in the Torah, we have this concept of the quarter. That's called the base core. A base core is a property that's able to grow one. The yield of that property on average is one core. Measurement of wheat. A, a core, I believe, is 30 saw. A, a, uh, we know that uh, two saw grow on the size of the area that the Mishkan was. Oh. Sorry, one, one saw. One saw for the size of the Mishkan. The Mishkan is, uh, what is it, 550 by, by uh, 100. I'm sorry, it's Sasayim. It's, it's two saw for the Mishkan. So 50 by 50 grows one saw. 50 by 50 grows one saw. There were 30 saw to a base core equals 75,000 square ounces. Now, when Yoival is in effect, if somebody gives his field to Hectish, he, he pays a fixed redemption value. It's a fixed amount. It doesn't make a difference how much the field actually yields or how much uh, or, or what it's actually worth based on its location and fertility, et cetera. The question now is, do we count these hills, these steep hills that are over, you know, they're over five feet high and they ascend relatively quickly. They're not just gradual slopes. Uh, do we count that as part of the property or not? Same thing is true with the holes in the ground. You have these deep, uh, you know, we have a, a what do you call it? Um, or these called ditches that go through the fields, collect the water. Is that count as part of the field or not? Like Similar. The vertical. So it's it's vertically four feet tall, roughly speaking, but it but it ascends relatively quickly. The the, the slope is uh, what would it be? It would be uh, 
Which slope at, I believe it's four over one. I think this is slope. All right, so it, it ascends. I believe it has to ascend a minute. I'm sorry, no, no, no. The entire height has to be over four amas. So what's the exact ratio there? Four amas is uh, um, 24. Yeah, it's about, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an angle of uh, close to 40 degrees. So it's a rel 40 degrees, a relatively steep climb. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's whether so is it included in this field that's sanctified? You have to redeem the field. If the field is a base core, it has a fixed redemption redemption value. But the problem here is some of the parts of this field are these ditches or these steep hills mm -hmm. or rocks. Is it encountered as part of the field or not? Second question is same, really the same question. When a guy sells a field, is that included in the sale or not? The guy says, I'm, I'm gonna sell, I'm gonna sell you a base core. Mm -hmm. And he they, they take a tape measure, they measure out the quarter. Here's the base core, um, and it has these hills. And the guy say, look, I want to plant a base core. I don't want to have to, you know, get a ladder to plant the area or, or you know, take a step, step, a step stool or something to get to get there. I, it's not what I bought, not part of the sale. Now, just to sum it up very quickly, the answer is that when it comes to selling property, if you have a hill or a ditch, it's not included. You need to measure a quarter. You need to measure a base core, a land that has a yield of one core, which is roughly speaking, 75,000 amas, mm -hmm. square amas, without these hills, without the ditches. So it's arable land. Yeah. There weren't bulldozers and excavators. No, no. It was done by hand, and that was quite expensive work. I think uh, I think one of the battles in, uh, to, after the after the Corbin of Bias, after the destruction of the temple, one of the battles, they leveled the hill as punishment. Oh. It took three years to level the hill. You know, meaningless work of just imagine how much work it takes to level the hill by hands. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. instead of uh, two people, you know, today they drive the so that Wall Street Journal article with their remote control excavators. Oh. It's crazy. You can have people in air conditioned rooms right. 10 miles away driving the excavator. Anyway, okay. Um, now that's the rule with regard to selling property. With regard to hectish, the rule is that it is included. It is included unless it's completely unusable, literally. What does that mean? I.e. the ditch is actually filled with water, so you, you literally can't plant it, or the, the hill is a rock, so it's not, you know, you can't, can't plant there. And the question the Gemara wants to know is, what's the story with regard to Kedushin? The guy, the guy says, I'm going to give you a base core. Do we count the hills and the ditches, whether they're filled with water, or specifically if they're not, or even if they're not filled with water? Do we consider it equal to a sale or equal to hectish? By hectish, we say that we only discount the hill, the, the, the hills if they're rocks and the ditches if they're filled with water. But by a sale, we, we discount them even if they're empty, even if they're they're arable, technically speaking, because it's 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 a, it's pain. You guys to climb up on a ladder, cherry picker, whatever it is. And the resolution of the Gemara is that we compare it to uh, hectish. And not to a sale. Okay, so that's where we are. The last line of Samach of Beis Tanan, we learned Hamakish Sadeo Bishasi Yovel. Somebody who sanctifies his field in the years that that Yovel is relevant, which we said there's a fixed redemption value. Nice and Bezer Chaimer Sa'arim Hamishim Shakal Kesef. For the base core, you have a redemption value of 50, 50 coins over fifty years, one coin per year. Payunikam Amukim Asarit Fachim. Let's say you have these ditches, ten Fachim deep. Or you have these rocks that are four feet high, roughly speaking. Three in it, whatever. Three, three and change. Okay. If it's less than, if it's, if it's less than, uh, uh, one second. So if it's three and a half feet deep or high, it's not included. If it's less than that, it is included. We had a question. If, well, it's true that it's not doesn't count as part of the base core, but if the guy sanctified this base core, so let it be sanctified of its own accords. So he sanctified two things. He sanctified the base core plus the hill and the hill and the ditch. Because it's not part of the measurement of the base core, because it's not arable. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it shouldn't be included. It's not, that's not true. It is included. Why? Because we see Sodden. In other words, you don't actually have to sanctify things in units of a base core. 
you can sanctify sanctify it in multiple units. A unit of less than a base core plus some small amount, whether it's a lesach, a chatzil, a saw, or a tarkif. Those are also measurements. So you can sanctify something of any size properly. So why isn't it included in the sanctification? Even though it's not arable, it should be sanctified as the guy sanctifies a little less than a base core, mm -hmm. plus a tiny hill and a tiny ditch. <laughs> any size works. So Amar Marok for Bar Chama, so Marok for Bar Chama explains, We're talking about the ditches that are filled with water. They can have me. It's similar, it's similar to the rocks, and therefore, because these things are literally non arable because there's water or there's a rock, so therefore, it's not included in the sanctification. When do we say that multiple units can be sanctified? That's presumably when there, when you, when you can uh, plant there. But when you can't plant there, that's not included in the sanctification. Uh, if that's the case, that it's literally not usable, then even if it's less than three feet, it should also be considered not usable. It's a rock, after all, or it's a puddle of water. Mm -hmm. So Gemara says, If it's small, so that's sort of considered the normal topography of the land. You know, you can't really argue that this is not included because it's not it's not arable. No, the, the land does have some rocks in it. There's always going to be some rocks, and that, that's included in the in the deal. Shidrud Aramikur, it's called part of the spine of the land. That's sort of how land works. Okay. That's the law of Hekish. Gabi Mechar tonight, with regard to selling property, we learned. I'm selling you a measurement that will yield you a base core. You have these stones or these 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 ditches. Okay, einim dodanima, they're not included. Pachas mikanim dodanima. If they're less than three feet, then they're included. In other words, if they're less than three feet, they're included in the sale. If they're, oh, okay. if they're more than three oh. feet, then they're significant and they're not included. Yeah. Even if the ditch is empty of water, technically speaking, he can go into the ditch and plant it in the plant in the ditch. Mm -hmm. So the Mars is my time. And why why is it included? Why is it not included in the sale? He doesn't want to have to go plant the field in three different places. He wants to be able to take his tractor and drive the whole field without having to stop his tractor, climb on top of it, and then climb onto the piece of property to plant it by hand. It's not what he wants. And the Gemara's question is, what's the story with regard to Kedushin? He promises to give her the base core. Is it have the laws of hektish? La hektish minamina law ayla machamina. Or do we compare it to a sale? So Mara says Mistavra, the re resolution is like I said, La Hektish Midamina law, the Amr Law Anotarachna the Zarana Umay Sina. The land is it, it, it is acceptable if the land has these ditches, even if, if if the ditches are not filled with water. Why? Because the guy could say, Look, uh, that's fine, I'll go into the ditch and I'll plant the ditch. So you don't have to stop your tractor, I'll I'll go ahead and do the work for you. So therefore, it's like hektish. It would be included in the sale, in the in the kedushin. So again, so if the guy promises his wife a, a base core for kedushin, right? And uh, kedushin on kedushin, I give you a base core, and he gives her a base core, and he had these little hills and these little uh, depressions, mm -hmm. you know, these ditches, and he can say to her, "Look, I'll go ahead and plant the, the ditch. I'll go ahead and plant these steep hills, and you don't have to worry about it." And that is, it's a valid argument, and the kedushin would be valid. Okay. Now we, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about conditions. Now we go right into it. Okay, three general rules. So where, where is the first condition in the Torah? The Bnei Gun and the Bnei Rufin, right? They they come to Moshe Rabbeinu and the Parshas Ma, uh, Masai, and they say to him, look, we want property on the other side of the Jordan River. Mm -hmm. And the deal is, we'll go and fight. We'll cross the Jordan with you and fight if you give us that land. Reb Meir, Reb Meir says, Kol Tanai She'enik Tanai God Bnei Rufin. Any condition which does not follow their their framework of condition, ain't it tonight? It's not a valid condition. Shenemar, as the Pasuk says, they, they, um, uh, this is Moshe Rabbeinu speaking. Yeah. Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, If you, so Moshe Rabbeinu, there are basically three critical components to the condition of those, uh, of the Bnei Gada and the Bnei Ruben, children of God and Ruben. What were the three components? Moshe Rabbeinu tells them, number one, Im Yavru, if you go ahead and fight with us, then you get your portion on the other side of the river. And if you don't get come ahead and fight with us, then you get a regular portion in the land of Israel. Okay, this is the most critical component. That's the one that we're talking about the most today. There are two more to talk about. So the first one is, 
the, the first one is mechlal lav at If I tell you no, do you understand the yes? Or if I tell you yes, do you understand the no? In other words, I tell you, if you cross the street, you get a million dollars. Well, what's the implication from that? If you don't cross the street, you don't get a million dollars. Now, according to Remeyer, that's not understood. You must specify. If you cross the street, you get the million dollars. If you don't cross the street, you don't get the million dollars. Okay, maybe I'm going to ask this different, but I don't want to go into that. Because once you specify this conditional, it's obvious that it's conditional. Mm -hmm. When I tell you if, it's not obvious it's conditional. So if I say, if you cross the street, you get a million dollars, then it's not obvious that if you don't cross the street, you don't get the million dollars. But if I say to you, on, I'm giving you the million dollars on condition you cross the street, the condition itself specifies both sides. Condition, this is a machlag, this is a this is what we learned around the yeshivas. It's a, it's a very long, uh, very very long discussion. This is a, and this is quite relevant today because the contract law effectively is one big set of conditions. So that's for a different discussion. Okay, that's the number number one critical component. The mayor says lav If I tell you no, you don't understand the yes, and we're going to go through that at length probably tomorrow. Okay, and that's the main one of this mission. There are two more. Number one is tonight kardim lamaisa, which means I, if I tell you. I'm giving you a million dollars if you cross the street. That is not an acceptable condition according to a mayor. It has to be the conditional first, then the action, then the result. So it's if then, not then if. Right? So it's if you cross the street, then you get the million dollars. If if you don't cross the street, you don't get the million dollars, which would be perfect normal condition. But if I say to you, then you, I'm giving you a million dollars if you cross the street. And remember, we're not going to use the word here on condition because on condition is different, different, it's a different halakha concept. We can actually specify the condition. So I'm giving you a million dollars if you cross the street. That's not a valid condition according to a mayor. And the third one is hain kaidim lalav. So I make it, so I said to you, if you don't cross the street, you don't get the million dollars. If you cross the street, you do get the million dollars. Not valid. You get the million dollars regardless. Why? Because I put the negative condition before the positive condition. These are the three laws from B'nai Gaudi B'nai Again, quick review. Number one is you must specify the positive and the negative. You must specify the 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 condition before the action, if then. And number three is, it's if yes, then this, else, else, this. So it must be the positive first, then the negative. So it's the condition, if you want to effectuate the condition, you must do this. Well, really, you must do this, then you effectuate the positive condition. And if you don't do it, you don't get, you don't, you don't fulfill it. And this is all in the opinion of a mayor. <clears throat> However, if Hanina disagrees, there is no evidence from B'nai Gada B'nai Rubin. In other words, the question here is obvious. Why does Ramesh Rabbeinu need to specify to them if you go the, if you go fight, you get the land. If you don't go to fight, you don't, you don't get the land. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you don't go, if I tell you if you fight, you get the land, then you can imply from that you don't get the land. Says Ramesh must be that every condition must have a positive and negative. Says Rav Hanina, that, no, you're wrong. Why? Because what's the condition of Ramesh It's of Ramesh Rabbeinu? It's a biconditional. What's going on? If you go ahead and fight, what do you get? The land on the other side of the Jordan River, right. on the east side of the Jordan. And if you don't get it, go ahead and fight, then what? If Moshe Rabbeinu was silent, what, we, what, we, what would we have said? You get nothing. You get yeah. nothing. But that's not what happens. Moshe Rabbeinu says, if you don't go ahead and fight, what's going to happen? You're still going to get it on the other. You get it on the right side of the Jordan, on the west side of the Jordan, yes. with everybody else. Because there's no condition to inherit Israel to have to fight. You want to go ahead and take elsewhere, then you have to come and participate. So, because there is an implication here that you wouldn't get property even on the even on the west side of the Jordan in modern day Israel. So, therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu did need to double the condition. Okay, it's a very good counter argument. What's Rav Chaim Ben Gamliel? Rav Meir. Rav Chaim has a very good argument to Meir. Rav Meir. Rav Meir would argue as follows. If you're telling me that, um, okay, in other words, if you're telling me the repetition of the condition that Moshe Rabbeinu makes is not to tell you tonight kofel, tonight kofel here means the double condition, the if and the and the if yes and if no. It should he should have just said, if you don't if you don't cross, you'll get it you'll get like everybody else. Why do you have to specify the eretz kanan? In the, in the land of Canaan. 
It must be that he's telling me the concept of a doubled condition, that every condition must be doubled. So in other words, Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't just double the condition. To a certain extent, it's understandable why Moshe Rabbeinu needs to say if yes, if no. And that I understand. And Romero subscribes to that. However, Moshe Rabbeinu says a lot more than that. A lot more than necessary. Why does he need to say more than necessary? Because actually it's necessary to say more than necessary. That's why. Because we do not say the rule of Mechal Avot Shemehem. We don't say that if you state the affirmative, you understand the negative. You need to specify both. That's why Meshur Benu speaks more than necessary. Okay. Reb Chanina Meyom Liel, Igla Kassar Rachmana Be'aretz Kanan, Hav Aminim Noach Zerachem Be'aretz Gilot. It could be used in a different area. In other words, maybe, maybe, in other words, if you go ahead and fight, you get the portion of Eretz, of, of, of uh, Eber Ayardin and Eretz Kanan. Uh, one second, I'm sorry. Sorry, you get I'm sorry, you get Avery Arden. You get you get the other side of the Jordan, the parts that you want, the parts of Sichan and Amon and Mayav. But if you but if you don't go ahead and fight, that you'll get a different property, a third property. So as you won't, you'll get inheritance, neither what you demand nor what everybody else gets, but you'll get a third possibility, Arad's Gilot. You wouldn't get anything. Just bars for a second. I'm not sure I have the interpretation right. Uh, okay. Sorry, I, 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 I misspoke there. Okay. Eretz Gilad is the Avery Arden that we're referring to. As follows. The condition is as follows. In other words, my, uh, the sons of Reuven and God basically are saying, look, we want this property, right? We want it for ourselves. So you know, you're going to get all of Israel, divide up into 12. We want this portion. We'll sp- we we want to split it 50-50. We'll take God, God takes half, Reuven takes half. So maybe the condition is as follows. If you go ahead and cross, then you get your you get what you want. You get, you get 50-50 in Eretz Gilad. If you don't go ahead and cross, then we take Eretz Gilad and we cut it up into 12 slices. You get nothing of Canaan and, and a 12th of Gilad, along with everybody else. And that's why that's why he has to say, no, no, no. If you cross, if you cross, if you come and fight, you get Gilad. Split it 50-50. Half to God, half to Reuven, later on, Menashe, mm-hmm. half the children of Menashe join. Okay. And if you don't go ahead and fight, then, then you get in Israel and 